As a result of 30 years of innovations in Islamic financial contracts then, Islamic banks' assets, from an economic perspective, look very much like those of conventional banks. <coughs> Almost all of their assets are invested in instruments to represent receivables of one sort or the other. There are, of course, particular problems that face Islamic banks' balance sheets. The prohibition against the secondary sale of a debt and a discount, for example, has hindered the liquidity of Islamic banks and thus Islamic restrictions sometimes operate to restrict the flexibility of these banks' day-to-day -day operations relative to, to their conventional counterparts. Nevertheless, Islamic banks function today in many ways that are indistinguishable from a conservatively managed conventional bank. From an economic perspective then, Islamic banks function more or less as conventional financial intermediaries. They aggregate private savings, invest them in debt or debt-like instruments, and earn a profit based on the difference between the income those assets generate and the amount of such income that is provided to the private savers. If the summit bank's assets, despite their Arabic names, do not have a substantial economic difference from their conventional counterparts, however, that is not the case with their capital structure. Like conventional banks, which obtain their capital through a combination of equity capital, i.e. Cap common shares and deposits, Islamic banks also obtain capital from the sale of common equity. Unlike conventional banks, however, Islamic banks do not have depositors, at least not in the conventional sense. In conventional banking, depositors are creditors of the bank, and therefore have a contractual claim to the assets of the bank that, are, that is prior to the claims of the bank's equity holders. This structure, of course, creates a familiar moral hazard problem, in that the bank's managers, who are responsible to the bank's shareholders, are encouraged to make risky investments in the knowledge that while shareholders enjoy 100% of the upside, their loss is limited to their capital. In other words, the bank's managers have an incentive to invest in projects that could result in the imposition of inefficient losses to the depositors. For that reason, depositors are protected by banking regulators and institutions such as deposit insurance. Depositors in the summit banks, however, are not treated as creditors. Rather, they are deemed to be investors and thus are referred to as investment account holders. The unique relationship of the Islamic bank to its depositors is the vestige of the influence of Islamic economics' argument that economic justice requires equitable sharing of risks and rewards. Accordingly, Islamic banks' relationship with their depositors, as a legal matter, is structured as an investment partnership between the banking corporation and the individual account holders, rather than as a creditor-debtor relationship. Pursuant to this relationship, the account holders provide capital to the bank which, along with the capital provided by the bank's shareholders, provides the bank's capital that it uses to make investment, purchase assets. The bank can then use that combined capital to enter into synthetic loans of the kind described above, or enter into new investment partnerships in which the assigned bank plays the role of the investor and the borrower takes on the role of the entrepreneur. Indeed, according to the Islamic economists who inspired this model, the Islamic bank would always be entering into equity investments, thus giving an Islamic bank, in theory, the appearance of a mutual fund or a private equity fund rather than a conventional bank. But as, as, we, as I already mentioned, in fact, the, the vast majority of Islamic banks' assets are actually debt-based <coughs> investments. So uh, the second step by making equity investments never really panned out. This structure is based on the Islamic contract, contract of Mubaraba, which is a kind of passive partnership. Uh, pursuant to this contract, the passive investor gives capital to an entrepreneur who invests it on the investor's behalf. <coughs> the entrepreneur and the investor then share the profits of the venture pursuant to a predetermined ratio, with the investor having the right to return of his capital before the entrepreneur is entitled to withdraw profits. While this structure is a reflection of Islamic econ economics' original impulse to prefer equity, equity investment, weaknesses in the corporate governance of Islamic banks actually exacerbate the moral hazard present in conventional banking. The managers of Islamic banks, who answer only to the bank's <coughs> common shareholders, still have the same incentive to invest in risky projects that could put the investment, could put the investment of the account holders at risk while asymmetrically benefiting the common shareholders. At the same time, the investment account holders have neither the right to vote on management, nor do they enjoy priority in a liquidation as would the depositors of conventional banks. Thus, Islamic investment account holders have neither governance, right, governance rights 
nor the contractual or regulatory protections of conventional depositors. Which I think causes a, raises questions about the long-term stability of the current Islamic banking uh, model. In assessing the accomplishments of the Islamic banking sector, then one can make the following observations. It has succeeded to a certain extent in creating a, what appears to be a sustainable model of private financial intermediation in the Middle East, especially in the investment banking or wholesale banking sector. It has also been successful in creating products that cater to high net worth Muslim investors seeking Islamic equivalents of conventional investment products. Claims that the economic behavior of Islamic banks is substantially different from those of the conventional se sector, however, remain dubious in my view. Moreover, viewed from the perspective of Islamic economics, the performance of Islamic banks raises profound question marks. If the purpose of Islamic banks was to provide a different model for financial intermediation, one that would be based more on risk sharing than debt, then the practice of Islamic banks can only be characterized as a disappointment. And indeed, many proponents of Islamic finance make the claim that Islamic banks as presently constituted merely represent a transitional phase to a new kind of bank that will in fact, in fact uh, take on uh, different assets, uh, economically different attributes than conventional banking. So there's sort of a, a waiting for Godot stage, right? This transition, and they keep, they keep saying, well, wait, wait, tomorrow we'll, we're going to change our behavior. But there's no evidence, in fact, that banks are taking any steps to, to change the way they invest their assets. Other Muslim economists take a more critical stance and describe the Islamic financial industry as merely engaging in what they call, the, what they call Sharia arbitrage whereby the goal is to break down a conventional financial, financial product into its simplest elements and then reconstruct it using classical Islamic contracts so as to create an Islamic parallel to the conventional product. In other words, the goal is not to change the conventional market, but rather to imitate it as much as possible. Right? So this state would be a per permanent state because that's the profit maximizing state. Islamic financial intermediaries then capture an economic rent by marketing such products to Muslim investors and institutions with no social gain, and perhaps a social loss in the form of added transactions costs. In any case, there can be little dispute that Islamic financial institutions have not yet contributed to the kind of economic change or broader social justice that its founders claimed would be the result of an Islamic financial system. In this respect, some statistics from the Islamic Developing, Developing Bank are quite revealing. And while these statistics are for the Muslim world generally, they are probably consistent with trends in the Arab world, or at least those parts of the Arab world which are not blessed with large hydrocarbon resources. According to a recent study by a pair of IDB economists, approximately 582 million individuals in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Egypt live on less than $2 a day. There are another 100 million poor Muslims in India under the same definition of poverty. In addition, between up to 80% of all Muslims have minimal or no contact whatsoever with the formal financial sector. This translates into almost 1.2 billion people. To the extent that financial intermediation is crucial to improving the lot of the poor by giving them greater access to society's aggregate savings, then it is hard to argue that the formal Islamic sector, despite its growth and despite its profitability, has been successful in promoting the kind of justice <coughs> development that Islamic economics have hoped to achieve. In an attempt to remedy the contradiction between aspiration and reality, some Muslim economists have recently called upon Islamic banks to give up the corporate form and convert to mutual banking structures. Or in the alternative, for Muslims to establish new Islamic banks using mutual structures which would be better suited from an institutional perspective to tackle the endemic problems of poverty and exclusion from financial services that face the global Muslim poor. The institution of the mutual bank has deep roots in community finance, having been used both in Europe and in North America by citizens who believe that private banking was more interested in generating profits than supplying credit to individuals in the community at low cost. In the United States, community banking was also associated with many religious groups that relied on the notions of communal cooperation to marshal the internal savings of the community for the benefit of individuals within that community who needed credit without attempting to profit from that need. Indeed, there is strong evidence that the earliest pioneers of Islamic banking were inspired 
by models of mutual banking that they encountered in Europe and believed that such institutions could assist in poverty alleviation in the Middle East. 